Hey, everybody. All right. So, um, we left off last time um, talking about the properties of the planets and why planets have atmospheres. So now we're going to zoom in and look specifically at the terrestrial planets. Um, what can we learn about the atmospheres of the terrestrial planets as opposed to the Jovian planets or maybe some other exoplanets that we're finding? Uh, we re recap from last time, right? Why do planets have atmospheres at all? Um, and the answer is because either the planet's gravity is strong enough to hold on to the gas so that the gas molecules don't reach the escape speed and escape the planet's gravity out into space, or because the planet is cold enough that the molecules can't reach the escape speed, right? What atmospheres a planet can have are based on both factors, are based on gravity and temperature. You can have a planet, you can have a, a, a planet with weak gravity and it can still hold on to an atmosphere if the planet's cold enough. Um, Titan is, Titan is the largest moon of Saturn. It's a moon. The gravity is very weak on Titan, and yet the moon Titan has an atmosphere because it's orbiting around Saturn and it's very cold. Hot Jupiters are very hot, right? Hot Jupiters are, are orbiting very close to their stars, and so they're very hot. And yet hot Jupiters can hold on to light gases. They can have hydrogen, helium atmospheres um, because they are Jovian mass. They are the mass of Jupiter, or in many cases, even more massive than Jupiter. And so a hot Jupiter can hold on to light gases in its atmosphere if it's high mass enough. Um, speaking specifically about the terrestrial planets, though, why do the terrestrial planets have an atmosphere, and why do they have the atmosphere that they have? Um, to take a step back to the Jovian planets real quick, uh, remember how the Jovian planets formed, right? The Jovian planets formed from a, a large icy protoplanet, and then that icy protoplanet had enough gravity to accrete on hydrogen and helium directly out of the proto protoplanetary disk. The terrestrial planets didn't do that, right? The terrestrial planets are smaller, they're less massive, their gravity isn't strong enough to pull gas out of the disk while the planets were forming. When the terrestrial planets were young, they were just rock, rock and dust that accreted together to form those terrestrial protoplanets. And when you take all that rock and dust and have it collide and smash into each other, the rock heats up and the rock melts. And then out of all that melted rock and magma, gases were released. There were gases that were trapped in the rock and the dust while the planets were forming. And when that rock smashed into the earth, let's say, and the rock melted, the gases were released. And so then you started having volcanoes. Eventually, as the terrestrial protoplanets formed, they were volcanically active and lots of gases were released out of the young volcanoes. In fact, this still happens today. Here's a picture of a volcano here on Earth. And when volcanoes erupt, a lot of gas is released because that gas was trapped in the magma and it's found a way to get out. This is where the atmospheres of the terrestrial planets came from. Um, we, call, we call the terrestrial atmospheres secondary atmospheres because they came second. You had to form the planet first and then the, then the planet had volcanoes, those volcanoes erupted, and those erupting volcanoes blew out a bunch of gas that then became trapped by the planet's gravity, so the planet has an atmosphere. And those gases, like we were talking about last time, what kinds of gases blow out of a volcano? Well, a lot of carbon dioxide, a lot of nitrogen, a lot of sulfur dioxide, a lot of hydrogen sulfide and methane and... Um, heavy gases, heavy molecules that could stay hanging around the Earth. They weren't light enough to heat up and escape the Earth's gravity. So this is how you have a, a terrestrial planet with an atmosphere. 
Not all the terrestrial planets have atmospheres, though, right? Uh, Mercury and the moon don't have enough gravity to hold on to an atmosphere. Um, here's a picture uh, that the Apollo astronauts took of the moon, right? When you look at the moon, the surface of the moon is airless. The sky is black on the moon because there's no sky. There's no atmosphere to scatter light. Why? The moon is just as hot as the Earth is, right? The moon is just as far from the sun as the Earth is. I mean, the moon and the Earth are the same distance from the sun, basically. So it's not that the moon is exactly hotter than the Earth, although sometimes it is during daytime, um, but it's that the moon has less gravity. The moon is less massive. And so any gas that you release, if you released any gas on the moon, um, it'll just float away. Mercury is pretty similar, although <laughs> uh, not quite, actually. Um, one of the big discoveries of the last few years is that Mercury does have a little, little bit of atmosphere. Um, NASA has a mission orbiting around Mercury right now. It's been orbiting for a few years now. It's called the Messenger Probe. And one of the things that the Messenger Probe discovered when it when it went into orbit around Mercury, is that Mercury has a very thin, very wispy, they're not even calling it an atmosphere, they're sort of calling it an exosphere. Um, but here's the thing, this atmosphere, this exosphere, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's made of hydrogen and helium, which is weird because, again, terrestrial planets don't usually hang on to light gases. Um, but the hydrogen and helium are coming from the sun. Remember, Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. And so the solar wind, the hydrogen and helium from the sun blows off of Mercury. And Mercury's gravity kind of holds on to it for a little while, slows it down until eventually it just blows away. The other components of Mercury's exosphere are stuff like sodium and magnesium and potassium. Now think about that for a second. When you think about sodium, magnesium, potassium, these are the stuff that make up rocks and minerals. This is not usually what you think of as being a gas. And yet, you're talking about mercury, a rocky planet, there is sodium, magnesium, potassium, there are these rocky elements on the surface of mercury and they are constantly getting baked by sunlight. And they are being so irradiated, so heated up by the intense light of the sun that some of that sodium is evaporating. It's evaporating and blowing off of mercury. And so here's a bit of a map of this, mer this, this sodium vapor hovering around mercury. Some of that sodium floats up here and it gets hit by sunlight and it blows away so that Mercury has a little bit of a tail, kind of like a comet, of, of sodium blowing away by, in the sunlight. Although look at this little divot right here. It looks like the, the sodium blows off of Mercury, the, the sodium gets baked by the sunlight, it evaporates off of Mercury, and then it floats around to the nighttime side. And when, when that sodium vapor gets to the nighttime side, it cools off and it refreezes back onto the surface again. So when I say Mercury doesn't really have an atmosphere, like, well, it, it, it really doesn't, but it does have this sort of vapor trail of, of hydrogen from the sun and also these rocky minerals like sodium sort of hovering around until it eventually refreezes on the other surface. It's very thin. It's really, it's not like you could call it air. It's this very wispy, thin vapor. For all intents and purposes, Mercury is like the moon, airless. Remember we were talking last time about the effective temperature model. The effective temperature model is the temperature that you would guess a planet would be warmed up to if that planet were just a bare rock with sunlight shining on it, which is accurate for the moon and for Mercury. 
uh, the, the makes the point that the temperature of Mercury, the actual temperature of Mercury, and the actual temperature of the Moon are pretty close to what the effective temperature predicts. Because, for all intents and purposes, Mercury and the Moon are just big rocks floating in space, being warmed up by sunlight until they warm up to the effective temperature, and then the energy in equals the energy out, and that's the temperature that it lands on. For the other terrestrial planets, they can hold on to an atmosphere. They have enough gravity to hold on to heavier gases. And so when you have an atmosphere, what else do you see on the surface of a planet? Well, when a planet has an atmosphere, it can have wind. And with wind, you can have erosion. Um, if a planet can hold on to an atmosphere, it can have clouds. And clouds can do a few things, right? Clouds mean it could rain. And with clouds, so you could get water erosion in the case of the Earth. Um, if a planet has clouds, that can increase the planet's albedo. So that can actually cool off a planet. And with an atmosphere, you can have atmospheric pressure. And remember, atmospheric pressure is what determines the melting point and the freezing point of water. You can't have liquid water without atmospheric pressure. If there was no atmospheric pressure, the water just boils away. So you need an atmosphere in order to have pools of liquid water like lakes and oceans, on a planet. If a planet doesn't have any air, then you can't have liquid water. You can't have um, wind. You can't have... <coughs> Here we go again. Uh, you can still have surface features on an airless world, right? You can still have volcanoes. You can still have craters from uh, impacts, um, but you don't have wind erosion and water erosion on a planet with no atmosphere. And you also get really dramatic swings in temperature from daytime to nighttime, right? Earth's atmosphere is really good at holding in heat so that, you know, it's warm in the daytime on Earth or, you know, it's temperate uh, during the daytime, but at nighttime the Earth stays pretty pleasant. Right? Here on Earth, when the sun goes down, it's not like the Earth freezes, right? Because we have this atmosphere, and the Earth's atmosphere holds in heat that keeps the temperature pretty moderate, even though it's nighttime. If a planet has no atmosphere, the only heat source is the sun, which means on the, when it's daytime, the planet gets really hot, and as soon as the sun sets, the temperature plummets. There are wild swings on the moon and on Mercury. There are wild swings in temperature from daytime to nighttime. Whereas when a planet has an atmosphere that can hold in heat with the greenhouse effect, then that tends to moderate things. It doesn't get, you know, the, the, the change in temperature from daytime to nighttime is not as extreme. Um, so let's look at this in, in a little more detail. We, we said this last time. Um, that the, temp the, the atmosphere of Earth is mostly nitrogen with a lot of oxygen, um, a variable amount of water vapor. What do I mean by a variable amount? You know, what do, we, what do we call the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere? It's the humidity, right? So, you know, sometimes it's humid and there's more water vapor in the atmosphere. Sometimes it's drier and there's less. But it, it usually hovers about 1%. There's about 1% argon which, again, uh, we don't really talk about argon very much in the atmosphere because it doesn't do very much. Argon is a heavy, uh, noble gas, kind of like helium or neon. Um, it's produced by the breakdown of rocks. It's produced, by, it's produced down deep in the, in the inside of the Earth, and it bubbles up out of volcanoes, and then it doesn't do much because, uh, like all noble gases, there, it doesn't really under... Uh, it really doesn't do... Uh, chemical reactions very readily. So, you know, about 1% of the air that you're breathing right now is argon, and you breathe it in, you breathe it out, it really doesn't do anything. It's uh, pretty benign. I mean, it's 
you know, it's useless is what I'm saying. Um, and then, you know, smaller amounts of other things like carbon dioxide. Um, when we talk about weather on the earth, um, or when we talk about climate, those are two different things, right? Weather and climate are two different things. The weather on earth, you know, what are we talking about when we talk about weather? We're talking about what is the atmosphere doing here today, All right? You're interested in what the water vapor is doing. Typically, you know, when we talk about weather, we're interested in what is the water vapor doing? Is it condensing as clouds? Is it falling as rain? Is it falling as snow? Is it is it low humidity and therefore it's a clear, it's a nice clear day? Um, the nitrogen, the oxygen, the carbon dioxide, that's not really changing from one day to the next. Um, but the water vapor can, and that's what drives weather. So when you talk about the weather, you're talking about what is the atmosphere doing here, like at, in a small geographic area today in a very specific short period of, of time. You know, what's the weather going to be like today or this week? So weather is the behavior of the atmosphere in a small area over a short period of time. Climate is the big picture. Climate, the climate of a planet is what is the atmosphere doing over a large geographic area? Usually, you know, average it over the whole planet, averaged over many years. So the weather is short, small scale. What's the atmosphere doing on the small scale? The climate is the large average, averaged over the whole planet, averaged over many years. So it's easy to get those two things confused, right? Weather versus climate. You know, the weather can change from day to day, right? It gets hot one day, it's cold the next day, it's clear one day, it's raining the next day. But when you take the long-term, large-scale average, you're taking the big picture. Well, how does the atmosphere behave on this planet overall? That's the climate. So you can learn a lot. You know, you, you, can, you can tell a lot about what a planet is like from the climate. And when the climate changes, it changes gradually over years and years and years, even though from one day to the next, the weather can fluctuate a little bit. The climate is really the big picture. The climate is, is influenced by larger forces than just, you know, whether it's windy one day and, and snowy the next. So what's the atmosphere on Venus like? What's the climate on Venus like? And when you look at Venus uh, through a telescope, um, it's cloudy. It's always cloudy. There is never a clear day on Venus. The entire surface of Venus is shrouded in clouds. And when good, when good photos of Venus were starting to get taken about a hundred years ago, people looked at that and they thought, oh, it's cloudy on Venus. Well, you know, what are clouds made of? Well, here on Earth, clouds are made of water vapor. So that must be what it's like on Venus. Venus must be, they thought, Venus must be really humid, which kind of makes sense, right? Venus is closer to the sun. If Venus is closer to the sun, it's going to get more sunlight, so Venus is going to be a little warmer than the Earth. Um, and if Venus is warmer, there's going to be more evaporation, and therefore it'll be steamy. A hundred years ago, people looked at Venus and they thought, oh, well, this kind of makes sense, right? It's, it's steamy, it's humid, it's cloudy. This is also, you know, about a hundred years ago, this is also sort of the golden age of science fiction when science fiction was becoming a thing. And so you'd have like these lots of stories, lots of science fiction stories back then about, you know, the, what, what is it like when astronauts finally land on Venus? And then you've got these astronauts, you know, coming out of their spaceship on Venus and it's like a jungle, right? It's like a uh, steamy and, you know, this is also a hundred years ago is also when, dinosaurs were becoming very cool and very in vogue. And so, you know, uh, so you'd have, you know, these astronauts landing on Venus and like, you know, trudging through the jungles of Venus and encountering dinosaurs on Venus because, you know, why not? Uh, 
The problem is, you know, what is it really like on the surface of Venus? You can't just point a telescope at Venus and take a picture of the surface uh, in the visible spectrum because all you're going to see is the tops of the clouds. But starting in like the 60s, when you could take infrared cameras and radio telescopes and point them at Venus, you can see through the clouds in the radio spectrum. And if you pierce through the clouds to look at the ground, Venus is not steamy and jungly. Venus is roasting. The surface temperature of Venus is, we said last time, about 750 Kelvin, which is about 900 Fahrenheit, right? Venus is not like, you know, a nice warm jungle. Venus is blasted. It is hellish. Why? Why is Venus so intensely hot? Well, because A, the atmosphere is so thick. Venus's atmosphere is about 90 times thicker than the Earth's is, and it's mostly carbon dioxide. 96.5% right? uh, carbon dioxide and about 3.5% nitrogen, which is just about the same amount of nitrogen that the Earth has. Right? The Earth and Venus are actually very similar. Keep this in mind. Earth and Venus are about the same size. They're about the same mass. Earth and Venus have about the same mass of nitrogen in the atmosphere, except that Venus also has a hell of a lot more of carbon dioxide, which is why it's 96% carbon dioxide and 90 times more atmosphere than the Earth has. There's not a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere. Venus actually is bone dry. Those clouds in Venus's atmosphere are not made of water vapor. They're made of sulfuric acid. <laughs> so uh, Venus is not the next great vacation destination. There's no astronauts going to be landing on Venus anytime soon because it is 900 degrees Fahrenheit and the clouds are made of sulfuric acid. What sulfuric acid is battery acid, right? The battery acid in your car, in your car's battery, that's sulfuric acid. Uh, why are Earth and Venus so different, right? If Earth and Venus are so similar, they're same mass, same size, why does Venus's atmosphere, why is Venus's atmosphere so thick with carbon dioxide where Earth doesn't have very much carbon dioxide? And the answer is because most of the carbon dioxide on the Earth got locked up as rock in minerals, in mostly in the form of carbonate rocks, whereas the CO2 didn't do that in Venus or on Venus. What do I mean here? What's, what's going on? Um, there's a process on the Earth and uh, to a lesser extent or to a slightly different extent uh, on Venus and on Mars, there's a process called the inorganic carbon cycle. Um, you've probably heard of the carbon cycle when you took a biology class, right? There's a, there's a cycle on Earth where carbon circulates around the ecosystem from life, you know, from the soil to plants to animals and then back to the soil and all that. This is different, right? There's a, this is a different carbon cycle. This is an inorganic carbon cycle. Um, so it's just chemical reactions, not biological. Here's how this works, right? So you've got carbon dioxide in the atmosphere here on Earth. Here on Earth, you've got carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That carbon dioxide can get dissolved in, in rain clouds and in raindrops. Carbon dioxide can dissolve in water. And so when, um, when that CO2 dissolves in water, then the rain falls and that rain falls to the ground and the carbon dioxide goes with it. And so when that rainwater flows through rivers and into the ocean, the carbon dioxide goes with it. So now, basically, the falling rain has scrubbed some of the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and it ends up in the oceans. It, the, the, the CO2 is dissolved in the ocean water. Um, 
when it does that, the carbon dioxide can meet up with some usually calcium minerals. There's calcium minerals dissolved in the water. And so the carbon dioxide and the calcium bonds together and forms carbonate minerals. And those carbonate minerals, like limestone, we were looking at this picture here a second ago. These are the famous white cliffs of Dover. Um, they're limestone, right? That's what limestone is. Limestone is calcium carbonate rock. So these limestone minerals settle out of the ocean, they sink through the ocean water, and they build up on the ocean floor. And these are rocks, so they sit there for a long time. That carbon dioxide left the atmosphere, flowed through the water, it got locked up as rock and sunk to the ocean floor. And it stays there for millions and millions of years until eventually plate tectonics, right, the motion of the tectonic plates on the Earth, take this layer of limestone, drive it back underground, drive it back into the hot molten mantle of the Earth, where once that limestone rock mixes with hot magma, the limestone melts. And once that limestone melts, that carbon dioxide is unlocked from the rock so that it can bubble back up through the magma blow out of a volcano again, and it gets mixed back into the atmosphere, where it can mix with the rainwater again and fall out again. So there's a cycle here. The CO2 goes from the atmosphere into the water, locked up as rock, back underground, where the it melts and it can vent out of a volcano back into the atmosphere. So when Earth was young, it probably had a much thicker carbon dioxide atmosphere, just like Venus does. Today, over the course of a very long time, on Earth, that carbon dioxide that used to be in the atmosphere got locked up on the surface of the Earth as limestone deposits. And so there are these huge deposits of limestone and other kinds of carbonate rocks all over the Earth. All of this carbon, all the carbon in these rocks used to be in the atmosphere. So Earth's atmosphere used to be thicker with CO2. And then it all got scrubbed out. As the, as the carbon dioxide got locked up as rock, the Earth's atmosphere got thinner and thinner. That didn't happen on Venus. All the carbon dioxide on Venus stayed carbon dioxide. Why? What does Earth have that Venus doesn't have? Water, liquid water, right? The Earth is abundant with lakes and oceans and rain. And so since the Earth has all this liquid water, the Earth, the, the water could scrub the CO2 out of the atmosphere and onto the, onto the surface as rock. Venus is bone dry. And so, when the volcanoes on Venus erupted, and Venus has lots of volcanoes, Venus is covered in volcanoes. When those volcanoes erupted, it pumped the CO2 into the atmosphere, and it was stuck. So that's why, four and a half billion years later, Venus's atmosphere is thick with CO2, but because the Earth has liquid water, a lot, most of that CO2 got removed from the atmosphere as rocks, and most of it today is stuck there. When Earth and Venus were young, they were probably twins, you know, about the same mass, about the same size. When Earth and Venus were young, they were probably both covered in volcanoes, erupting, venting out gas, pumping out that secondary atmosphere, thick with CO2. And yet, you change one little thing. Earth and Venus used to be twins. But if you change one little thing, those two planets evolved completely differently over the course of billions of years. You change one little thing. Earth has a lot of water. Venus doesn't. And that's why today Earth is a nice temperate place with a thinner atmosphere. Um, and Venus baked. I mean, the atmosphere is so thick on Venus. The atmosphere traps so much heat that, that Venus bakes 
under all of the heat held in by that atmosphere so that um, so that Venus is roasting it's it's what do I say 750 Kelvin 900 degrees Fahrenheit uh, and and just a slight wind because actually Venus is not rotating very fast um, remember we talked to, remember when we talked about the nebular theory Venus is the planet that's rotating backwards um, but Venus rotates backwards slowly and since ro since Venus rotates really slowly uh, the wind is not very fast so there's just like you know <laughs> I mean it reminds me of like how insultingly hot it, it gets uh, in you know Phoenix in the summer right it's 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 roasting hot but just with a light wind just to add insult to injury well Venus is even worse here's what it looks like on the surface of Venus um, uh, we've only landed on Venus a few times. There's only a few probes that have ever landed on the surface of Venus. These pictures were taken from the Venera probes, which the Soviet Union landed on Venus in the um, 70s and 80s. These are the ones that lasted the longest because imagine this, it's 700 degrees Fahrenheit. The surface of Venus is hot enough to melt lead. And so when you land a robot on Venus, as soon as it hits the ground, it starts melting. The probe that lasted the longest is, I think, this one, Venera 13, if memory serves. Venera 13 landed and it survived. It was able to take pictures. So that's what you do. You land the probe. You just like, that's the lens cap. That's the lens cap of the camera, right? So you, you land the probe, you pop the lens cap off, you start taking all the data you can, measure the temperature, measure the wind speed, take all the photos you can, and then broadcast all that data back to Earth because as soon as that probe lands, things start melting. Venera 13 was the probe that lasted the longest. It survived for about half an hour. <laughs> After half an hour, everything melted. And, and we lost contact. Um, NASA has landed a couple of probes on Venus. I think the Europeans and the Japanese have sent a few also, but um, most of the work landing on the surface of Venus was done by the Soviets back in the day. Um, there was sort of a, uh, there was sort of a casual agreement um, between the U.S. And, and the Soviet Union, you know, back during the Cold War, that like, you know, Russia spent most of its energy studying Venus. The U.S. spent a lot of its energy studying Mars. That way they didn't sort of duplicate efforts, right? That way they didn't waste time, you know, just um, uh, working against each other, you know. That way they could get more done. And so a lot of this uh, research, you know, especially back in the 70s and 80s, a lot of the research on Venus was done by the Soviet Union. Um, Mars is similar to Venus and different in many ways. Venus's atmosphere is also mostly carbon dioxide. Um, but instead of being very thick, it's very thin. Think about this, right? All three terrestrial planets, Venus, Earth, and Mars, I mean, there's four terrestrial planets, but the, the three that have atmospheres, Venus, Earth, and Mars, all of the terrestrial planets formed at the same time. They formed out of the same protoplanetary disk. The uh, Venus, Earth, and Mars all formed out of the same rock and dust. When all three planets were young, Venus, Earth, and Mars probably all had carbon dioxide atmospheres because carbon dioxide is one of the main gases that blows out of volcanoes. Four and a half billion years later, Venus's atmosphere is thick with CO2. Mars's atmosphere is mostly CO2, but Mars is smaller. Mars is less massive. The gravity isn't as strong on Mars, and therefore Mars isn't able to hang on to as much atmosphere. Earth probably used to have a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere, but then most of that carbon dioxide got scrubbed out by the inorganic carbon cycle. Today, 
Mars's atmosphere is so thin that it can't hold on to that much heat via the greenhouse effect. And so that's why in the last lecture we were saying the actual temperature on Venus is much hotter than the effective temperature predicts because Venus has so much greenhouse effect. Earth is a little bit warmer because the Earth has a little bit of carbon dioxide. The Earth has a little bit of greenhouse effect. Mars has even less. Mars's actual temperature is only like 10 degrees warmer than what the effective temperature predicts because that's how thin the atmosphere is. There's a little bit of greenhouse effect on Mars, not that much. So because Mars doesn't have that much greenhouse effect, the temperature can change pretty dramatically from summer to winter. Uh, in winter, sorry, in summer, it's almost up to about 280 Kelvin, which is right about at the freezing point of water. So in the middle of summer on the hottest day, the temperature gets almost, you know, just about to the melting point. In, the, in winter, though, it drops to 150 Kelvin. Well, here's the thing. Carbon dioxide freezes at 180 Kelvin. Mars's atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide freezes at 180 Kelvin, but in the winter, the temperature drops to 150 Kelvin. In winter, the temperature gets cold enough that the atmosphere itself freezes on the surface of the planet. And so when you look at the ice caps, the ice caps on Mars are made of water, because the water is always frozen, and carbon dioxide. Uh, here is what the North Polar ice cap looks like at the end of winter, at the beginning of spring. So the, uh, the, the North and the South Polar ice caps have a permanent cap. The permanent ice cap is water. The water always stays frozen. And yet over the course of the winter, the ice cap grew all of this temporary ice cap here is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide that used to be gas, it was air, and yet the winter was so cold that the air itself freezes as ice on the surface. And so over the course of the winter, the, the polar ice cap gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You can actually watch as the atmosphere thins out. The atmosphere thins out over the course of the winter as the air, as the CO2, turns from a gas into ice on the surface. And then at the beginning of spring, it starts to warm up, right? The, the temperature gets a little warmer and a little warmer, and then eventually the temperature gets above 180 Kelvin. And once the temperature gets above 180 Kelvin, all of that carbon dioxide goes from a solid straight into a gas. Right. What is carbon dioxide ice? Right. When carbon dioxide freezes, what do we usually call it? We call it dry ice. Right. When you go to the grocery store, you're having a Halloween party, and you want to like throw a brick of dry ice into your punch bowl to make it fog up like that. Um, that's dry ice. That's carbon dioxide ice. Right? Carbon dioxide does not melt. Carbon dioxide does not go from a solid to a liquid. When carbon dioxide warms up, it goes from a solid directly into a gas, and that's what happens here on Mars. When spring rolls around, all of this ice vaporizes. It, turn, it warms up and it turns straight into a gas, and then it expands rapidly. So there is a dramatic change in the weather when when all of that here's the so here's the uh, the ice cap at the end of winter here's it here's the ice cap in summer right when when in the middle of summer the water ice is still frozen that's the permanent ice cap right here that's that's just the permanent ice cap all of the rest of this all the rest of the carbon dioxide ice has evaporated and when all of that when all of that carbon dioxide starts evaporating, it expands, right? It's, it's going from a small little chunk of ice into a big expanding 
wall of gas. All of this ice starts expanding in all directions. And so you, you end up with this wall of air expanding off of the ice cap and pushing from north to south over the entire surface of the planet. It's all gone by summer. Where did it go? It turned into wind. When every time spring rolls around, which turns out to be about every three years, all right, because Mars, Mars has a longer period than the Earth does. So spring in the Northern Hemisphere happens every three years. Here is a, here's a couple of pictures from, uh, you know, 2001. So a little, a little while ago, but it's, it, it illustrates the point. Here's a picture of Mars um, at the beginning of Northern Spring. Here it is just a few months later, from June to September. What happened is spring started, all of this carbon dioxide started expanding. And when that carbon dioxide starts blowing south, when that when all that air, when all that gas starts blowing across the surface, it picks up dust. It's like a haboob, right? If you remember a few years, we haven't had one in a few years, but if you remember living here in Arizona, you remember when that big dust storm would blow off the desert, just this wall of air blowing off the desert, picking up all the dust and forming this wall of dust storm that blows into the city. That's a haboob. That's basically what happens on Mars every three years, except that instead of covering the city, this dust storm covers the planet. This, when all of this ice turns into gas, it blows across the surface of the planet, picking up dust in its trail, and it covers the entire surface of Mars is covered in a dust storm that blocks out the sun for weeks. This dust storm, this haboob, lasts for weeks. Until finally, the wind dies down, and when the wind dies down, all that dust can settle out of the air, and it settles back onto the ground, and then the dust storm is over. But every three years, it happened in 2001, happened in 2004, happened in 2007, and 10. Like clockwork, every three years, every time northern spring rolls around, the planet is covered in another dust storm. Um, in 2004, Four, that's when NASA landed the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. And so they landed, you know, they, 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 they planned it out nicely. They, they, uh, they scheduled it just right so that they waited until the dust storm was done in 2004, and then they landed the, the, the Spirit and the Opportunity rovers, the robots. Um, which is a good thing, because the Spirit and Opportunity rovers were solar-powered. They had solar panels, and so they needed to get sunlight to uh, to recharge their batteries. And so everything worked fine. Spirit and Opportunity were working just fine for three years until 2007. In 2007, the dust storm picked up again. The, 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 the dust storm blotted out the sun for weeks, and so the robots couldn't recharge their batteries. They couldn't get any sunlight. And then when the wind died down, all of that dust settled onto the ground and including, including the dust settled onto the solar panels of the robots. And so there was, there was a few weeks of panic at, at NASA when the engineers here on Earth were trying to figure out how do we knock the dust off of the robots so that the solar panels can get the, some sunlight. And it took a few weeks of them figuring out how to like teach the robot how to shake off the dust Kind of like, I mean, it really was sort of like getting the robot to like shake back and forth until the dust got knocked off. Um, this is one of the things we're going to have to deal with, you know, when we finally build cities, when we finally, when we finally build colonies on Mars, this is something we're going to have to deal with. Presumably one of our main power sources when we build colonies will be solar power, you know, uh, solar panels, except that we're going to have to factor in the fact that every three years, we're going to lose power for a few weeks. <laughs> um, how are we going to deal with that? How are we going to adjust? Well, we haven't even figured out how to build the colonies, let alone work out the, the details like that. Um, but that's one of the concerns we're going to have to deal with is, you know, 
some pretty extreme weather um, that's predictable, so we can account for it. Um, but that's, you know, when we start moving out into the solar system and building cities and colonies elsewhere, um, every planet's going to be a little different and we're going to have different challenges that we don't have to deal with here on Earth very much. All right. So um, we've been dancing around one thing for a couple of uh, lectures now. Um, we've been talking about the greenhouse effect and how, how atmospheres can warm up a planet. Um, we're going to go into the details. How does the greenhouse effect work? Um, and how does an atmosphere warm up a planet like it does on Venus, Earth, and Mars here? Um, so that'll be the next lecture. All right. Um, hope this is making some sense. If you've got some questions, um, go ahead and, and uh, log into the live chat and ask away. Otherwise, uh, come back for the next lecture on the greenhouse effect. All right. Bye, everybody.